This video is going to be a little different than my usual format. I recorded all of it two years ago, but haven't been sure how to put it together because there was so much dialogue and TV noise in the background. Rather than edit around that, I'm just going to play it and fast forward and talk about Roman footwear in general. You don't really need me to narrate what's actually going on, you seem like a smart kid. If you've seen many Roman statues, you might notice there's not a great deal of variety in the clothing they wear. The men wear togas or maybe armor, and women wear a long dress called a stola in one kind of shawl or another. Compared with the array of forms we have today, Roman fashion was very standardized and mostly looked like curtains. Of course, it's not a complete picture because statues were generally very formal, and they only depicted the statue purchasing class, or maybe some figure from mythology but never the pores, unless maybe they were naked. Compounding this issue of representation is the fact that clothing is not the kind of stuff that we tend to find in the ground these days. If wool or linen is left in some musty tomb or buried for two millennia, it doesn't survive like metals or ceramics. There are exceptions, like in the dry environments of Egypt and Israel, just like there are occasional color frescoes of clothing in lower classes but it's hard to get a full picture of this aspect of Roman life. All of this is what makes their footwear interesting to me. Even in statues, it can be shown in faithful detail, and we can see that there was a greater variety of shoes and sandals than there ever was in clothing. And unlike the scarcity of recognizable garments, there are literally shitloads of Roman footwear in the archaeological record. Leather survives better than cloth for a few reasons. One, by its nature, it just does. Leather doesn't decompose as easily as textile because the tanning process is a preservation process. And two, when clothing wears out, it can be cut up and reused for other stuff. Cloth was expensive. When shoes wear out, there is not as much material to recycle even if the material was worth saving. So people just chucked them in a ditch with the rest of the trash. And luckily for us, sometimes that ditch would stay wet and oxygen depleted, so today we can have that trash. Sometimes I wonder what trash of ours future archaeologists will find interesting. Then I think they'd probably be more interested to find a place that doesn't have our trash in it. And then I think there are no archaeologists in the climate-doomed future. There is only Googles on mobile and the starving masses it burns for fuel. But hey, they're technically renewable, so the market innovated a solution after all. Uh, right, Roman trash. Uh, so there were a couple sites, notably the forts at Vindolanda and Vindanissa, where we have these ditches that turn up all kinds of leather. If the finds weren't cool enough on their own, they can also be placed in pretty tight time frames, so fashion trends can be tracked, sometimes down to the decade. For example, there was a trend where the tip of the sandal around the middle toe was extended to a point, and another where the front of men's sandals were absurdly broad and angular because I guess duck-like feet were extra manly. In the second century, certain mostly enclosed shoes started to have asymmetrical straps that remind me of soccer cleats. Here's the moment I got a book in the mail, by the way. Too late to be any help in this project, naturally. Often when going through these finds, I'll be surprised at how contemporary they look. This woman's sandal is one. It's got a nice little leaf decoration, a sculpted multi-layer sole, even little stamps that probably represented a respected maker. You could see that in a store today and not think anything of it. It begs the question, did fashions change just as rapidly as they do now? Did they throw away items simply for being considered out of style? Did rich patricians own fashion mills full of child slaves and dodge responsibility for their leaky tanneries poisoning the nearby town's drinking water with a quiet donation to the provincial governor and, uh, okay, we already went there once. You get the idea. They were just like us. So the most basic method for making a leather shoe was to cut out one piece of leather that wrapped around the foot and laced across the top. A single T-shaped seam at the heel was necessary to form a foot shape. This type of sandal is identified with the Latin word carbatina. It's always a little hard to be sure what words refer to what type of footwear, though. The categories we use for archaeology might distinguish types differently than the original terms intended, setting aside any different definitions used in ancient times. 
Another common form of sandal was made from three parts, the outsole, the upper, and the insole. The upper was the same concept as the carpatina, and the insole and outsole were just two extra layers of foot-shaped leather sandwiching it. Caligai, the military sandals, were a branch of this construction. They were made for hard outdoor use, and the single layer outsoles were fastened to the upper with a bunch of iron hobnails to protect the leather from wear and provide traction. My sandals sort of fall into this category in that they are three layers. Since they are for a Halloween costume and not based on actual finds, I skipped the hobnails though. Those will fuck up the floor most places. The extra part that I'll call the tongue serves the same purpose of the thong on flip-flops, and the laces of the sandal branch off of it. I picked up that detail from a couple of statues, although I don't know if that was common in Roman times or if it just got copied over from earlier Greek art. This was two years ago. Maybe I was looking at Greek statues to begin with. It's artistic license, sue me. And now I'm out of script that I prepared before I started editing. Maybe it's just me, but I'm not sure I like this edit. Kind of feels like a dumpster fire to me. I don't like the high speed for lots of this because I never held things still for very long, but to be honest, I need to clear all this two-year-old footage from my hard drive, and I don't feel like redoing it. So there, a bit of honesty to make up for being lazy. I've worn these for a couple Halloweens now over what amounts to a few days. Hardly a thorough test, but they haven't fallen apart yet walking around on pavement. If I had one complaint, it would be that the leather I used for the upper is really too thin and soft on its own. It bunches up under my heel a little bit and could use a reinforcement there. That's actually a detail you see in some finds, but I'm not doing it now. And I had half a cow's worth of this stuff because it was considered flawed and therefore cheap, so it is what it is. This was my first finished Roman project with any semblance of authenticity, but today I wouldn't consider these sandals a proper reconstruction, what with the floppy thin leather and made up pattern. Still, I hope you got something out of it, and I'll probably make better ones later, so I hope you'll stick around to see that. Can't get out of the way.